For many of the military analysts who expected the Russian military to rapidly overrun Ukraine in the event of an invasion, Russia's disastrous performance in 2022 and Ukraine's subsequent fight back were a dramatic shock. One of the world's great militaries, a near-peer threat, was being driven back by a force that had a pre-war budget of about $6 billion a year. Since my very first video in March 2022, I've dedicated a lot of time to trying to explain Russian military underperformance. How could it be that a force with superior numbers, superior technology, and a much superior budget was struggling so much? And make no mistake, the Russian military in Ukraine did underperform. Images of vast columns of destroyed Russian tanks followed by several successive Ukrainian counteroffensives proved in no uncertain terms that some of the old inflated estimates of Russian military power were erroneous. Russia was not in fact a country that could go blow for blow with NATO if it didn't get its way in any given geopolitical crisis. Now, I've never hidden my personal opinions. I believe Ukraine has the right to be a sovereign and independent state within its internationally recognised borders. But it's always important not to have wishful thinking colour your analysis. One of the great mistakes the Russian military made before invading Ukraine was in gravely underestimating the capacity of the Ukrainians to resist. And while assessments may generally be positive about Ukraine's long-term prospects, it would be folly to assess the Russian military as a beaten or a broken force. Quite the contrary, for all of its failings, the Russian army remains a very dangerous opponent. It is a large force with deep reserves of equipment, areas of distinct capability and technological advantage over its Ukrainian opponent, a number of determined and capable units, and a capacity to learn and adapt. Failing to appreciate that is a recipe for underestimating Ukraine's requirements and for misprojecting the way the war will progress in 2023. And so today I want to look at some comparative areas of Russian military advantage in Ukraine and explain some ways in which the bear's claws are still very sharp. To do that, I first want to look at a couple of geopolitical factors, how Russia is able to shape opinion at home and abroad using propaganda, and also the critical role played by Belarus. Then I'm going to look at some of the harder factors around Russian military performance, so unit capabilities, fires and logistics. That's right, I'm going to say some good things about Russian logistics. We're going to talk about the technological advantage, the ability of Russian forces to learn and adapt, and also their endurance in industrial and military terms. And then I'm going to bring it all together into one holistic picture. Because identifying areas of relative Russian advantage or capability is not the same as saying Russia is going to win. It's just a key part of assessing the challenges that Ukraine still faces. A quick note too on sources, which will be in the description as usual. I might have to look for an alternative solution there because I've been finding that I hit the character limit in the YouTube description box and as a result have to cut some of my sources. This work is a composite of a number of sources. There are two key reports by the Royal United Services Institute, which I highly recommend, a number of American publications, and also interviews and comments by active and non-active combatants in Ukraine. But for all that, I want to stress the extreme uncertainty here. The Russian army is a large one. That means anecdotes that are applicable to one unit or one part of the front may not be applicable elsewhere. You might have Mobix dropped in a trench without food or water on one part of the front, while elsewhere a unit is being issued with brand new drones and thermal images. So while I've tried to draw useful general conclusions, be aware of the dangers and uncertainty involved. And before we jump into hard factors around Russian combat performance, capabilities, industry and mobilisation, I wanted to open with a discussion of something a bit different. I wanted to talk about Russian information warfare and the effectiveness of Russian propaganda. Now, I've seen people who are quick to mock Russian state TV and propaganda. They look at it and they look at the ridiculous statements, the threat to nuke a European city every different week, the blatant contradictions within the messaging, and they seem to think that this makes the propaganda stupid or ineffective. Now, to be fair, the Russian narrative certainly does try and have its cake and eat it too when it comes to primary narratives. For example, when Russia needs to justify its offensive actions, well, then it faces an overwhelming threat from Ukraine and the West. You've got a post from the Russian mission to NATO there talking about how badly outnumbered and outgunned the Russian military is. It is because Russia faces this insurmountable threat that it had to act. But at the same time, Russia is so strong compared to Ukraine and the West that the West is only prolonging the war in Ukraine by sending weapons. There's no hope that Ukraine could ever win. And if they don't back off, Russian tanks are going to roll through Berlin and Warsaw. So is Russia weak or strong compared to the West? The answer is yes. In terms of global politics, the claim is that Russia is standing up against imperialism. 
at least until an hour later where a commentator will literally say that Russia always has been and always must be an empire. Someone else will chime in and say that Russia must defend its strategic interests, it must influence the internal politics of other countries in that sphere of influence, anywhere that the Russian Empire once was, everywhere that the Soviet Union once was, everywhere in Russia's territory of strategic interests, and when asked where the borders of Russia end, the answer, it seems, is nowhere. So Russia is an anti-imperialist empire with massive irredentist territorial claims. Logic checks out. Moving on. Ask Russian propaganda what the relationship between Russians and Ukrainians are, and on one hand, Ukrainians are their brothers. They say they're there to liberate the Ukrainian people from the tyranny of the government in Kyiv, even though they change their war goals so that regime change is no longer a stated objective. And this whole thing is, they would argue, just a tragedy, basically a civil war. But later on, there will be remarks about the fact that Stalin probably should have just deported all of the Ukrainians and the city of Kyiv should be made uninhabitable. And there are some quotes questioning the humanity of the Ukrainian people that are so extreme, I'm not even sure I can put the screenshots on YouTube. So let's just say these narratives don't go well together and move on. Finally, because I think I've made my point by now, Russia is at once completely alone in the world. Military reverses are explained by the fact that Russia is fighting alone against, as Solovyov would put it, 50 satanic countries, the entire NATO alliance. But at the same time, Russia will inevitably win because Russia is not alone. It has overwhelming international support. In the UN, apparently 70% of countries are for Russia, which is an interesting interpretation of the vote where 141 countries voted against Russia, five voted with it, and 35 abstained. Now, while it's easy to laugh at these apparent contradictions, I'd argue they're a feature, not a bug, because different audiences are going to pick up on different messages. In different echo chambers around the world, those who are opposed to the US, for example, can pick up on the anti-imperialism messages and support Russia for that reason. Ultranationalists within Russia will, you know, ignore those and instead focus on the ones where, you know, conquering large parts of Ukraine and restoring the Russian Empire would be a really good idea. There are parts of the message that will never work on a foreign audience but will work domestically. For example, the argument that Europe is all freezing, that sort of propaganda, might work for people with limited media access in Russia, but isn't going to work for a pro-Russian European, for example, who knows for a fact that they're not all freezing to death in their flats. But the inverse might be true on another message. A pro-Russian European might accept the whole, everything is going according to plan, the Ukrainian army has been destroyed, we are winning argumentation. Whereas within Russia, those arguments don't really land as much because with obituaries going up, fear around mobilization, that sort of news filtering through family networks, there's a greater awareness there that no, everything is not going according to plan. And even if no particular narrative thread is picked up, it just succeeds in muddying the information landscape. It takes a couple of seconds to make up a lie, and it can take a long time to dispute and debunk it. And if you throw enough lies into the information space, you encourage people to throw their hands up and say, how can we possibly know what is true and what is false? It becomes tempting in that environment to discard all claims by all sides, regardless of whether one is more reliable than the other. And if the truth isn't on your side, then destroying the very concept of truth and the ability of most of the audience to find it is to your advantage. In many ways, it's like electronic warfare jamming on a battlefield. Jamming blinds everyone, but if the other guy has a whole bunch of senses and you have none, then jamming is in your interests. And in that respect, I'd argue that Russian propaganda is often effective. And I also don't think we should rule out the effectiveness of the weaponization of the Soviet Union's World War II history. For many in the West, this might be hard to understand. It might be tempting to ask questions like how could the legacy of a defensive war be used to justify an offensive one? And how is it that Russia feels it can monopolize this legacy? Doesn't it belong to all the republics of the Soviet Union? Didn't millions of Ukrainians fight bravely in the Red Army as part of that war? But World War II was a deeply traumatic event for the people of the former Soviet Union. Its importance is burned into the collective memories and psyche of the population. Victory Day is a major national holiday. And so if you put two young singers in front of a massive World War II monument and have them sing Rossiya Esnami Esnami Bog, it's going to resonate with some people.
it doesn't have to convince you, it just has to convince some of the Russian people that the suffering involved in this war is worth it and the battle should continue. And that is as much a strategic challenge as the tanks and shells that are flowing from the factories. The other point worth talking about up front is the critical role that's being played by Belarus. I've talked before about the fact that Belarus's army probably doesn't pose that much of a threat to Ukraine. The Russian army has stripped the Belarusians of some of their ammunition and any attack from Belarus would realistically have to be led by Russian forces. But in a strategic sense, Belarus has been invaluable. The country provides the Russian forces with extra training grounds, hospitals, supporting infrastructure, repairs, facilities and other forms of logistical assistance. They serve as a safe haven because Russian forces located in Belarus can't be attacked by Ukrainians. And yet by positioning forces in Belarus, Russia guarantees that Ukraine will always have to keep troops on its northern border just in case another offensive is forthcoming. To get a sense of the strategic significance of that, imagine if Ukraine was able to launch rockets and missiles from Finland at St. Petersburg, but Russia was not allowed to retaliate against targets in that country in response. So while I wanted this video to focus on the capabilities of Russian forces themselves, from a strategic perspective, it's impossible to move past the advantage that Belarus has given the Russians. So with that said, let's get into the harder part of this discussion, Russian military capabilities and performance in Ukraine. Because whereas before February 2022, the public meme of the Russian army was of a force of muscled VDV paratroopers, dual-wielding PKMs, and gunning down the they-them armies of the decadent West, now the meme has often gone too far the other way, to the point where the Russian army is made up entirely of starving conscripts incapable of tying their own shoelaces or operating their World War II bolt-action rifles. Now, at first glance, this trope of the poorly armed, poorly trained, poorly equipped, demoralised Russian conscript seems to have some evidence behind it. We've talked about the problems Russia had with its mobilisation process before. You've seen the images of the Russian AKs, the complaints around the bad food or the lack of training. And I've showed you the social media posts of Russian figures complaining about individuals with no military experience or minimal training being sent to the front line and basically proving to be useless. The musicians from the conservatory, as Alexander Korkovsky described them. And certainly, units like this, largely composed of untrained, poorly motivated personnel, these do exist. They take the form of units like the mobilised personnel who were overrun at Balaklia at the start of the Kharkiv counteroffensive or of the mobilised personnel who make video after video on social media appealing to their local government leaders to do something about their terrible equipment situations. These units have been shown to have some value in terms of making up numbers, holding lines and filling trenches. And early in the war in particular, Rusi observes in its report that mobilised personnel from Donetsk and Luhansk were commonly sent forward to draw Ukrainian fire and help identify positions. But overall, pro-Russian commentators and also interviewed Ukrainian officers generally assess many of these pure mobilised units to have limited offensive combat value. Triangulating the various sources out there seems to suggest that these units did have an impact in stabilising Russian lines last year when they first began to arrive, but they don't have the elan or capability to function as offensive shock troops. And that's a reality which would apply equally on the Ukrainian side. Poorly equipped and poorly trained units are not suitable for complex offensive operations, but they can probably hold a trench. But the mistake here would be in assuming that all Russian units are like this. That just because some units made up of mobilised personnel have shattered when contacted by the Ukrainians in a serious way, that all Russian units have behaved the same way. Because I would contend the Russian army still has some hard edges, and some of its regular units in particular have performed with some skill and stubbornness, particularly on the defensive. And here the performance of Russian paratroops is worth noting. These forces took heavy casualties in the opening day of the invasion. They were, for example, thrown forward to take Hostomel Airport, which to their credit, they did, only to be thrown back by heavier Ukrainian units as part of a counterattack. Since then, the Russian airborne forces have acquitted themselves in defence a number of times. You'll remember that Ukraine was eventually victorious at Kherson, but it was a grinding, difficult fight. Russian supply lines had to be cut, the positions strangled, shelled, battered and overcome one by one. And the city itself was only taken when the overall Russian position there was no longer viable. Much of the defensive action taken in Kherson for the Russians against those Ukrainian offensives was by these airborne units. And Ukrainian commentary, including that of some Ukrainians who fought in the region, 
suggests that generally speaking, these units resisted with skill and determination. For their part, Russian commentators often complained that the airborne units were occasionally let down by other supporting arms. And after Kherson fell, Russia was quick to redeploy these airborne units to other areas of interest. We talked last week about how the Russian Ministry of Defense claims that these units were instrumental in the capture of Solodar, whereas Ukrainian commentary focuses on the contribution of the Russian airborne in holding onto positions in Luhansk Oblast, places like Kremina. But in any case, it's clear that these units have made and continue to make a contribution. Which leaves me asking the question, what would have happened if they hadn't been so heavily attrited early on in those offensive operations? Or vice versa, what would have happened if they hadn't made it out of Kherson intact? My point is that while some Russian elite units have a questionable performance record, looking at you, certain guards, tanks units that have a habit of leaving an awful lot of equipment behind, Others have proven themselves stubborn opponents that have made it very difficult for Ukrainians to dig them out of their defensive positions. Meanwhile, in recent months in particular, with the fighting focused on Bakhmut and Solidar, a lot of the media focus has been on the capacity of Wagner. Here again, there's an alignment between publicly released Western intelligence and Russian military commentators. On one hand, British intelligence and the ISW have concluded that Russia is increasing relying on units like Wagner for its offensive potential. And on the other, even usually quite gloomy Russian commentators like Strelkov have observed that local victories are possible using competent shock units like Wagner. Now, when talking about Wagner and its performance at Bakhmut, there are two competing and quite extreme memes or versions of reality. On one hand, there's the caricature of Wagner sending forward under-equipped, untrained convicts from the Russian prison system to basically zerg rush the Ukrainian positions. And on the other, the idea of the elite Wagner infiltration team picking apart the Ukrainian defences. Based on commentary by pro-Wagner channels on social media, as well as interviews with veterans of the Bakhmut Front on the Ukrainian side, both in terms of foreign volunteers and Ukrainian officers, there in fact seems to be a bit of truth to both characterizations. The first echelon of any Wagner offensive is often made up of convicts drawn from the Russian prison system. Their job is to go forward and identify weak spots in the Ukrainian defences, which an awful lot of the time means, well, dying, because if they die, well, it's not a weak spot now, is it? Some Wagner commentary suggests that they aren't really phased by these casualties. But once a weak spot is identified, the second part of Wagner comes out, the actual professional Wagner troops, the infiltration units. And here, Ukrainian interviews paint a picture of a well-equipped, capable, trained force. Units with night vision goggles, thermal optics, IR tabs, the best drones that are available, and good training and tactics. These units can then move into and behind Ukrainian positions, overrunning defences. And while the prisoners suffer disproportionate and horrific casualties, they enable this second group of Wagner fighters to achieve their objectives with comparatively fewer. A Ukrainian TDF unit might be more than a match for a bunch of undertrained and under-equipped convicts scraped out of the Russian prison system. But if they don't have night vision or thermals of their own, they're going to struggle at night against some of Prigozhin's best. Now again, I want to nuance the point here before people get carried away and start thinking that Wagner is some SEAL Team 6 cosplay. Even the better, quote-unquote, Russian units have been seen using a mixture of equipment. You've got a Wagner team operating an artillery piece on the image on the right there. That's an artillery piece that went out of production in the late 1940s. That is a World War II or immediate post-World War II artillery piece. So Wagner clearly has some guys with top-of-the-line equipment. It's got a couple of T-90M tanks, but it's also got some World War II artillery. Similar nuances hold on the Ukrainian side. You might have units operating a small amount of the latest and greatest NATO-generated hardware, but they might also have some Toyotas with MLRS systems strapped onto the back. But the basic premise holds. There are some Russian units that have decent equipment, tactical acumen, and capabilities that make them dangerous. And they're made all the more dangerous because of the Russian army's next great and enduring advantage. And that is the Russian army's continuing and enduring advantage in artillery and long-range fires, because even though its artillery units are less active than they were during the peak of the Donbass offensive last year, Russia still has a significant advantage in tubes and shells. At the earliest stages of the war, for example, Russia assessed that Russia had roughly a 2-to-1 advantage over its Ukrainian opponent, 
2,433 artillery barrels were matched up against 1,176. But over time, Ukraine's ammunition stockpiles started to run low, and by June, the Russian Federation had a 10 to 1 advantage assessed in volume of fire. That's the rough period of time where you'll see those estimates of 60, 70, 80,000 rounds a day fired by the Russian artillery. While Ukraine might manage 4, 5, 6, 7,000 in return. And on the point of the Russian artillery advantage, this is again a point where you will find some consensus between commentators on both sides, albeit they'll differ on the details. For example, if you take a very negative pro-Russian commentator like Strelkov, he might observe that in parts of the front, morale is low, the quality of troops is limited, and the only thing holding it together was the capacity of the Russian artillery. Meanwhile, you might find very confident pro-Ukrainian commentators who assess that their army is generally superior to the Russians in a vast majority of ways. But why do they still have problems? Well, again, because of the Russian artillery. Now, to be fair, those same sources will often assess that Russian artillery is less precise or less responsive than its Ukrainian equivalent. But the numbers are there, and numbers have a certain utility all of their own. Not least because having more guns and more ammo helps solve a traditional dilemma when it comes to organising artillery. For example, you could devolve the control of guns down to a very, very low level, dividing up all your artillery and giving control of it to small units. So if Private Conscriptovich comes over a hill and sees a Ukrainian machine gun position, all he has to do is get on the radio, call the assigned artillery piece and put a fire mission, a neutralisation fire mission, onto that machine gun nest. That's a really quick and agile system, but what it lacks is the ability to prioritise and coordinate. So if, for example, uh, Colonel Kleptovsky and his column, a kilometre away, has encountered an entire Ukrainian armoured column and wants to put as much artillery on them as possible, well, it's going to be difficult getting onto the guns that are over-supporting Private Conscriptovich. And there's also very little incentive to stop Conscriptovich and Sergeant Bisepsky from just dropping artillery fire on everything that they encounter. Why risk getting shot? If there's some movement in those bushes over yonder, well, drop some 152 on it, even if it turns out to be a rabbit. So you could go all the way in the other direction. You could vest all of a division's artillery pieces under the control of one divisional FSCC, Fire Support Coordination Commander. And all of a sudden, you don't have any prioritisation problems anymore. The divisional officers can see the entire battlefield and they can decide what targets deserve to be serviced by what pieces. They can do planning at a wider, more strategic level. The problem is, at least theoretically, the system then loses some of its responsiveness. If Sergeant Bisepsky and Private Conscriptovich run not into a rabbit in a bush, but a Ukrainian tank column, then the process of getting artillery put on that target now involves calling up several levels of command until eventually that information makes its way all the way to division. TC 7-100.2 observes that fire support for OP4 is generally, quote, top down and that the highest level of participating unit will approve of a fire plan. That, generally speaking, makes Russian artillery very good at engaging fixed positions like cities, towns and entrenchments with a large number of guns and pieces, but not as good at engaging small or moving targets or targets at short notice. But the trick with having lots of guns is that in some circumstances you can do both. You can let Private Conscriptovich go rabbit hunting while also reserving guns at a higher level. Some interviews with those who fought at Bakhmut suggest that some of this might be happening. They observe that there are still those large-scale concentrated artillery fires that try and suppress and neutralise Ukrainian positions, but also that individual Wagner shock units, or likely more accurately, the drone operators observing the assault of those Wagner shock units, seem to have a direct line to at least some artillery and that if a Ukrainian position is revealed during the assault, then responsive fires, not just with grenade launchers or mortars, but sometimes with larger pieces, can be directed towards them relatively quickly. It's not a particularly elegant organisational solution, but it's one that having a lot of artillery barrels and ammunition available enables you to make. One Ukrainian I spoke to also observed that the Russians are generally relatively capable and willing to put down artillery rounds even without drone spotting and correction in place. They've got enough guns to do it the old-fashioned way with a bloke on a radio politely requesting that a given grid coordinate be deleted. And it's this continued advantage in volume of artillery fire that enables so many of Russia's other tactics in Ukraine. Without enough local artillery to both do counter-battery suppression of Ukrainian guns 
and neutralization fire against Ukrainian trenches, Wagner's infiltration assault tactics at places like Bakhmut wouldn't work nearly as well. And the whole concept of grinding out the Ukrainian military through attrition is enabled by Russian artillery superiority. Rusi observes that in the early stages of the war, it wouldn't be unusual for Ukrainian units covering a three-kilometre frontage to be subjected to something like 6,000 rounds of artillery fire per day. And the Russians routinely exploited that advantage to put the Ukrainians into a dilemma. In the opening stages of an attack, LNR or DNR conscripts would be pushed forward to skirmish with the Ukrainians and reveal Ukrainian positions. That would be followed by, quote, total saturation of defended areas to compel withdrawal. This would then create a dilemma for the Ukrainian forces, because if they left the ground that was being shelled, the Russians would advance. If they held the ground, then they would continue to be shelled, suffering casualties. Although even withdrawal would only provide a temporary antidote, because once the Russian guns had been retargeted, the whole process could begin again. Now, this is not a fast or a cheap process for the artillerymen when they're using unguided dumb shells. A guide put out by a Russian veterans group suggested that roughly 2.5 tonnes of artillery ammunition is required to defeat a single individual in a dug-in position, with that translating to 1,250 high-explosive fragmentation shells to neutralise 75% of a dug-in platoon. But with enough shells and enough time, the numbers add up. But that sort of artillery-based approach would only be possible with good supporting logistics. Which is why it's worth talking about the fact that, in at least one respect, I'd argue Russian logistics have done well. Now, I can already hear the sound of everyone smashing the unsubscribe button because I did just say the Russian army and logistics in the same sentence, but hear me out. Yes, this is the Russian army that had a 40-mile convoy essentially bogged down, stop in a giant traffic jam, and then eventually, after being attacked repeatedly by TB2 drones and artillery and Ukrainian raiding parties, turn around and go home. And yes, this is an army that in 2023 still doesn't really know what the forklift or the pallet is. Seriously, they still individually pack artillery shells in individual boxes in ones or twos that have to be manually carried out of trucks and then opened up. But most of that is logistics at the tactical or relatively low level. It's about what happens after the supplies are unloaded from a train and have to be trucked to the front. And there, at that level, Russian logistics have often been a visible train wreck. But at the strategic level, when it comes to moving equipment and supplies long distances by rail, it's a very different story. Now, in some ways, this shouldn't be surprising. The Soviet Union placed a tremendous emphasis on the railroad and its role in time of war. Kind of makes sense given the role of the USSR as a primarily land power. It also just reflected a different approach in general to infrastructure planning. The Soviets really, really liked trains. And so they built railway tracks in the same way that Americans built roads. Like the Soviet Union, the Russian Federation retains dedicated railway troops who handle both organisation and repair of the rail system. Russian logistics from railheads forward is not going to win them any medals, but Russian rail logistics themselves have done relatively well. This is both in terms of exploiting their own infrastructure, but also getting Ukraines back online and in use. So the next time your government tells you that repairs to the local road or rail will take 6 to 12 months, remind them that the Russians and Ukrainians can fix a railroad and get it operational in less than a month while people are shooting at them. As Rusi observes, from day plus 20 to plus 30 of the Russian invasion, the Russians began to secure and exploit surviving rail infrastructure. And in part because of that, the Russian command managed to ensure the unloading of military echelons 30 to 50 kilometres from the line of contact in most directions. So carrying something 2,000, 3,000 kilometres by rail wasn't really a problem. Getting it 30 kilometres from the railhead to a unit, now that might be a problem, but the first leg of the journey, not so much. And when I say 2,000 or 3,000 kilometres, I'm not exaggerating, I'm in fact selling the Russians short. The 83rd Guards Airborne Assault Brigade fought in Ukraine. Its presence has been confirmed by the obituaries of some of the men who fought within it. But to get to Ukraine, it would have had to cross basically the entire breadth of Russia from the Far East. But maybe it's possible that they move by aircraft, which wouldn't have been an option for the tanks and armoured vehicles of the 155th Guards Naval Infantry Brigade. Now, that unit became famous for the letter that its unit's members wrote after the first disastrous assault on Pavlivka, but that unit is based as part of the Pacific Fleet in Vladivostok. 
It reportedly fought at Kiev and later on at Pavlivka. Now, for those of you who aren't particularly up on your geography, Vladivostok is a very long way from Kiev. By rail, that's a roughly 10,000 kilometer journey, which is more than the distance between Tokyo and Los Angeles. But even they aren't allowed to complain because the 40th Naval Infantry Brigade also participated in Ukraine, traveling from their base on the Kamchatka Peninsula. These sort of long redeployments are not easy. Most militaries have to practice this in order to get it right. And the Russians, for the most part, seem to have gotten it right. Along with an effective rail system, the Russian system of logistics also helped save the day in the early war. Very generally speaking, there are two main ways to configure a logistical system, be it for a military unit or a factory or a business or a retailer, a push system or a pull system. In a pull system, the forward unit or the factory or the business sends information up the chain on what they need. We've sold 20 computers, please send us 30 more computers to refresh our stock. Or as a military unit, please send us, you know, X spare parts, X tanks, X ammo, whatnot, in order to make sure that the unit is getting what they require. Now that has an advantage of being both nominally efficient in terms of what is sent and very well matched to unit requirements. If a unit is not engaged in combat, it's not going to be sent a bunch of ammunition. If it's uh, involved in very heavy combat, and it asks for a heap of ammunition, well, the ammunition will hopefully arrive. It means hopefully you don't end up with enlisted soldiers building little forts out of excess ammunition boxes when what you really need is, you know, a couple of parts to fix the coffee machine. The problem is it's also complicated. Requests change frequently, good communications and inventory management are vital, or the whole thing can fall apart. If there's not very good communication between the forward unit and whoever's handling the logistics and resupply, and those requests don't come through, well, then the unit might not get things that it desperately needs, not just being short on repair parts for the coffee machine, but also on ammo. That's a gross oversimplification, but that's pull logistics in a nutshell. Supply is a reaction to realised demand. A push system reverses this relationship. The boss decides what supplies you get, you get those supplies, and you tell the boss you're happy with them. Whereas in a pull system, demand occurs and supply is made in response to that demand, a push system tries to pre-calculate demand and then pushes the supplies down the chain regardless. So before Russian units go into an attack, the headquarters calculates the likely consumption rates, there are a mathematical formula for determining that, and then the supply system pushes that down the logistics chain regardless of what happens until the supply plan is adjusted. Now that obviously has disadvantages. If I'm running a store and headquarters anticipates that I'm going to sell 30 computers and I sell zero, and they send me another 30 regardless and then another 30 the week after, they basically end up with these giant piles of computers that I can't sell. If I'm a military unit and headquarters anticipates that I'm going to go into very heavy combat and then I don't, I end up with a whole bunch of excess ammunition and vice versa. If they anticipate low consumption and I have high consumption, well, I'm shit out of luck but at least my coffee machine probably works. But there is a major advantage to this push system that the Russians employ. It doesn't require particularly good communication or coordination in order to make work. It was a system conceived for nuclear warfare where communications would be broken down by nuclear detonations going off everywhere, radios being jammed and communications being basically impossible. So it does well in chaotic circumstances because the supplies just get pushed down the logistic routes regardless. And so, Rusi observes, although the Russian logistic system was chaotic in the first phase, the structural efficiency of the approach ensured consistent supply throughout the offensive in the Donbass. So even when communications were bad, supplies would continue to flow, and because, according to TC7-100-2, ammunition has the highest priority within the Russian sorry, the OP4 supply system, if nothing else, the shells were sure to arrive. And if the shells arrived, the guns were firing, and if the guns were firing, Russia still had access to one of its primary advantages. I also think Russian logisticians have demonstrated they're capable of learning and adapting to changing circumstances. I really hate the meme that suggests that Russians are incapable of learning or adapting, so this is not going to be the last time this presentation I deal with it. So as I already noted, logistics in the opening stage of the invasion were a little bit of a shit show, and so Rusi observes the Russians were forced to reorganize their logistics at day plus seven. 
It's observed that by the end of April, the Russians had moved most of their logistics concentration zones beyond a 50-kilometre security zone line. And both Ukrainian commentators and also satellite imagery confirmed that after the introduction of HIMARS, which extended the threat range against Russian logistics, there was an adaptation on the Russian side. They moved their unloading points from their railheads further away from the line beyond HIMARS range, they dispersed their ammunition depots, they better concealed a lot of their points of concentration, and generally adopted a less efficient but less vulnerable approach to logistics. So supply became less efficient, but you also didn't have two, three ammunition dumps exploding every single day, which was a great loss for pyromaniacs on the internet, but probably a great boon for the Russian army. In short, this sort of strategic logistics network enabled the Russian way of war. Those train lines enable the constant flow of ammunition, reinforcements, replacement barrels and materiel that facilitates the Russian style of artillery attritional-based fighting. It also enables redeployments. Units can move from the north to the south, to the east, to the north, to the south, to the east as required, taking advantage not of their own organic transportation in many cases, but of the railway network. And this is going to remain a Russian advantage until one of two things happen. Either Ukraine is given enough maneuver assets to cut ground line of communications, that is, cut train lines by physically taking the train line's location, or they're given long-range weapons capable of hitting logistical targets behind the lines. That would likely have a significant near-term impact on the ability of the Russian army to fight the way it has. It's why Ukraine has been asking for ATACMs on long-range systems for as long as they have, but still those systems are not in sight. And until they are, this will remain a critical advantage area of the Russian military. But strategic logistics aren't the only area of strength for the Russian military. Compared to the Ukrainian opponent, technology arguably is one too. Now, we've talked before about some of the challenges that Russian defense industry faces in terms of producing its latest and greatest technology on time, at budget, and most importantly, at scale. But that still gives it a significant advantage over the Ukrainian military in a number of areas because most of the Ukrainian equipment is on average older and less modernized. That leaves the Russians with advantages in armor, infantry fighting vehicles, artillery, electronic warfare, and a number of other areas. I was able to find, for example, attestations of Ukrainians who've encountered the Russian T-90M tanks, which is the most advanced Russian tank that we've actually seen in service. I do not think we will see Armata on the front line. I just don't think it will happen. And if it does, it will only be in very small numbers. But in that report, the Ukrainians express a considerable degree of respect for T-90M and suggest that in a tank-on-tank conflict, they'd probably need multiple older Ukrainian tanks in order to have a good chance against T-90M. And the situation is true with IFEs, where Russia had a much larger number of BMP-3s than Ukraine did, for example, or with artillery, where Russia had a much larger number of modernized self-propelled guns when compared to their Ukrainian opponent. Now, Ukraine was able to make the older systems work just fine, but that doesn't mean the newer Russian systems don't have significant advantages. And while some commentators are quick to laugh at the Russian army for rolling older equipment out of reserve and into the field, it's important to remember the Ukrainian army is not equipped entirely with Western main battle tanks and HIMARS as its artillery system. The Western stuff just hasn't arrived in sufficient numbers to make that possible, and so there's a lot of old Soviet scrap still in service. BTRs that are basically falling apart, tanks that really belong in the junkyard but are being pushed into service. An artillery unit might have a Crab or an M109 or a Caesar, or it might have a Mitsubishi that Pavel straps some rockets to. And while Russian rocket artillery might not compare favorably to M270 or HIMARS, it's probably a match for Pavel's pickup. So anytime the Ukrainians achieve anything, remember they're often achieving it with a disadvantage in technology. And nowhere is that advantage in technology and modernization more apparent than in the air war. Because in the air, physics is king, and no amount of courage or tactical acumen will increase the range of a radar set or increase the maximum output of an engine. No matter how much heart there is in the cockpit, painting an aircraft blue and yellow will not make it go faster. When compared to the war on the ground, the war in the air is far more asymmetric, both in terms of technology and in terms of numbers. The aircraft of the Russian Air Force vastly outnumber their Ukrainian opponents and are almost uniformly of more modern designs, and importantly, their missile systems are as well. 
Whereas on the ground, Ukraine has often been able to achieve local superiority in terms of manpower, they have always been outnumbered in the air. And while Ukrainian ground-based air defense has proven effective at keeping the Russian air force out of Ukrainian airspace most of the time, Russian ground-based air defenses are likely lethal to any Ukrainian aircraft that don't fly at extremely low level. Now here too, there were some teething problems for Russian ground-based air defenses early in the war, but once they mastered advanced tactical techniques like not having their electronic warfare units jam themselves and actually turning the radar systems of the air defenses on so they didn't get blown up by slow-moving TB2 drones, the ground-based defenses have largely been effective. The result is whereas Ukraine was largely able to reverse the momentum on the ground and gain the advantage at Kharkiv and Kherson over the Russian army and retake vast swaths of territory, in the air the war remains a war of attrition, which for the moment stands very squarely in Russia's favour. Now how many Ukrainian aircraft have been lost depends on who you ask. If you ask the Russian Ministry of Defence and General Konoshenkov, for example, who would never lie to anyone, they shot the entire Ukrainian air force down relatively early on and have continued to shoot it down multiple more times since that point. Given Ukrainian aircraft apparently have a respawn timer, I'm not sure how Russia intends to win this particular conflict, but there you go. But jokes aside, the visually confirmed lost data is relatively dire. Since the beginning of the war, Ukraine is visually confirmed, according to Oryx, to have lost 56 aircraft, including a majority or near majority of its pre-war Su-24 and Su-25s. In an excellent November report on the Russian air war in Ukraine, Rusi identified that Russian ground-based air defences had generally been highly effective since March, which is, you know, when they figured out the whole turn the radars on thing, um, particularly calling out the S-400 air defence system. Ukrainian defences were likewise effective, but also vulnerable to attrition. Rusi noted that if Ukraine was not supplied with additional missiles for its existing systems or NATO systems introduced, then the Russian air force might over time be able to attrit Ukrainian air defences and become a major threat once more. The report also called for Ukraine to get Western fighters and air-to-air -air missiles to redress a major imbalance in air combat itself. And in talking about air combat in Ukraine, I'm about to say some things that might ruin the next Top Gun film, but please don't shoot the messenger. According to the reports we have, in the early stages of the war, when Russian aircraft were flying deep into Ukrainian territory, there was some room for Ukrainian pilots to exploit flexibility and smarter flying in order to take the fight to the Russians. Ukrainian pilots were flying older aircraft with inferior radars, they didn't have fire and forget ordnance, but with gumption, good tactics and smart flying, there was a chance to make up the difference. According to Rusi and a number of other reports though, we don't really see much of that sort of fighting anymore. The new Russian tactics consist largely of flying on their side of the border, spotting Ukrainian aircraft flying at low level at very long range using their radar, and then yeeting long-range air-to-air missiles in beyond visual range engagements. Here, two missiles in particular are very notable, the AA-12, aka the R-77, which has a long range, and the AA-13, aka the R-37, which has a bloody long range. Now, R-37 isn't particularly maneuverable. It's intended to kill large lumbering targets, AWACS, tankers, at very long range and moving very, very quickly. Ukrainian fighters that can manoeuvre are not a typical target. But a Ukrainian aircraft might not always get good warning that one of these missiles has been fired, and flying at low level right at the deck, they're not exactly drowning in excess energy. And so by firing relatively large numbers of these missiles at individual Ukrainian targets, the Russians can pose a threat and the Ukrainians can do absolutely nothing in response. It's the kind of brutal technological advantage that doesn't have much of a tactical answer. Without better equipment, there is no solution. And so the Russian Air Force maintains a considerable advantage over its Ukrainian opponent. Now make no mistake, the Russian Air Force has dramatically underperformed, both compared to pre-war projections, and also compared to the massive investment made in it when compared to the results it's achieved. But even if they're underperforming and can't do operations deep within Ukrainian territory, they do enjoy an advantage close to the front. The Russian Air Force flies more attack sorties than the Ukrainians do, and their losses as a percentage of their active force are much lower than Ukrainian losses have been. That means that while Ukraine can keep the airspace contested, the prospect of Ukraine ever gaining air superiority or being able to support its offensives with large-scale air attacks in NATO style 
Well, those seem unlikely for the moment. The only possible solution would be to give the Ukrainians a significant technological advantage over the Russians, but also to provide that solution at scale. Until then, the combination of better technology and mass is going to likely continue to give the Russian Air Force a distinct advantage in the air. And the situation is pretty much similar when it comes to the naval war, although here you could argue the disparity is even more dramatic. Ukraine began the war with a small navy, but its flagship was scuttled and most of its ships destroyed in the opening months of the war. And in the opening weeks of the war, the Russian Black Sea Fleet also postured as if it was planning some sort of amphibious landing to help threaten Odessa. That obviously didn't happen. And with the collapse of the Russian ground offensive towards Odessa and the introduction of anti-ship missiles and the untimely demise of vessels like the Moskva, the Russian Black Sea Fleet mostly moved out of range, missile range rather, of the Ukrainian coast. Now, much like the Russian Air Force doesn't like to get in range of Ukrainian ground-based anti-aircraft missiles, Russian warships don't like getting in range of ground-based anti-shipping missiles. Instead, the Black Sea Fleet has mostly pulled back out of missile range and often bases itself on the other side of Crimea or in Russia itself. But a lot of the Russian Black Sea Fleet is, however, intact. And without long-range weapon systems, the Ukrainians don't have much ability to reach out and threaten them. And while the Russian fleet isn't going to win the war by itself from the far side of Crimea, it is a constant strategic handicap to the Ukrainians. Russia can bring materiel in through all of its ports. It can trade with the rest of the world. Ukraine can only move cargo through Odessa through mechanisms agreed by Russia. Grain can be exported, for example, but the Americans can't put a whole bunch of Abrams on a ship and dock it in Odessa. Russia's ships and submarines also serve as a platform to launch cruise missiles at Ukraine from yet another direction. And that leads on well to a discussion of one of Russia's other advantages. Russia's ongoing advantage in very long-range weapon systems. Humans have long understood that being able to hurt the other guy from further away than he can hurt you is a great way to stay safe. In the Hellenistic period, when pikes were the primary offensive weapon, Pikes grew to massively long lengths because people realised whoever had the longest stick had the advantage. To stretch the analogy potentially too far, in the war in Ukraine, the Western allies have given Ukraine some very long sticks, and then wondered why Ukraine asks for more when Russia starts breaking out the sniper rifles. Russia possesses a number of long-range strike capabilities that either have no or very limited Ukrainian equivalent and which outrange most Ukrainian systems in some cases by an order of magnitude. And Russian doctrine relies on these long-term weapons. It allows for the integration of long-range systems into operational level planning. An integrated fire command at a divisional level, for example, might be able to write Iskander or air launch cruise missile strikes into their planning. And what that means is that Russia has the option to service targets well beyond the line of contact. A Russian commander hoping to break through a Ukrainian line can task fire not just against the Ukrainian forward positions, not just against their third line trenches, not just against their ammo depot 50 kilometers behind the line, but maybe against one of their high command centers 200 kilometers behind the line if they know where it is, or maybe nearby airfields that might launch aircraft in response. If the Russians can see it and identify it, and that is a big if to be fair, there are weapon systems in the Russian arsenal capable of hitting it. In the early stages of this war, many of these weapons were used at the operational level. As Rusi observes, up until April 22, there were 200 Iskander strikes, many of those in salvos against targets in the Ukrainian rear. As the stocks of Iskander began to deplete, the Russians switched to firing single missiles instead of salvos and to using SS-21, which is Toshka, in the Donbass instead of Iskander. In recent times, another major threat has been Russia's loitering munitions and kamikaze drones. In particular, I'm thinking here of the Lancet series. Now, while I've got an image there of one that was stopped by a high-tech defense system, otherwise known as a net, around a Ukrainian artillery piece, these things are responsible for a number of kills against M777 artillery pieces, ground-based air defenses, and self-propelled guns. None of these options are perfect. Lancet has range and duration limitations, as well as being vulnerable to things like nets. Iskander is an extremely capable system, but only available in relatively small numbers. But these systems do give Russia a range of options to strike at multiple range brackets. Meanwhile, Ukraine only has so many rockets for their limited supply of HIMARS systems, and those can only fly so far. 
At very long range, the situation is even more acute. Ukraine has a handful of modified Soviet-era Tu-141 Strij drones in order to attack Russian long-distance targets. Meanwhile, Russia has entire families of cruise and ballistic missiles capable of hitting Ukrainian cities and critical infrastructure. Even worse for Ukraine, most of those weapon systems are launched from platforms that are well beyond Ukrainian reach, either from warships or Russian strategic bombers firing from within Russia itself. And the mere existence of these weapons imposes a tax on the way the Ukrainians operate compared to the Russians. If the Russians move their logistics 100 kilometers back from the front line, they're essentially safe. But nothing in the Ukrainian rear is truly safe. Everything has to be dispersed, camouflaged, or covered with air defense. Ukraine can't set up a large repair facility that can be seen from space because it's vulnerable to long-range missile attack. Ukraine can't concentrate large numbers of troops in one area because they would be vulnerable to missile attack. Russia is invulnerable 100 kilometers from the front line. Ukraine is vulnerable all the way to the Polish border. And unless there's a major shift in the weapons that Ukraine is being supplied, they're going to have to continue to operate under this handicap. Now, before we move from talking about Russian capability on the battlefield to the capabilities of the Russian state, its industry, its mobilization systems, etc., there's one more point I want to make, and that is that Russia can learn. It can realize the benefits of experience. And if we take a sober look at the way the Russian armed forces have conducted themselves in Ukraine, we can see some evidence of exactly that. At an organizational level, the Russians have made a number of changes. They started the war without a unified command structure. There was no one person in charge. The Ukrainians had Zhuluzhny, but the Russians had several commanders essentially fighting their own wars. Now Gerasimov serves as the commander of all Russian forces in Ukraine. If you talk about organization at a lower level, well, anecdotally at least, the battalion tactical group, which is what Russia talked a lot about at the beginning of this war, is basically dead as an organizational unit. They're supposed to be all arms forces, right? They have infantry, they have armor, they have artillery, they have air defense. The problem was if, for example, all the infantry get killed, even though most of the unit is intact, the artillery is still there, the ground-based air defenses are still there, all those units are still entirely intact, the BTG itself is completely combat ineffective. And so the Russians found themselves trying to combine different BTGs together, and it just it was a bit of an organizational mess. Now it's reported the Russians have largely fallen back on an old Soviet-style system of organization. Nimble is out, endurance is in. In terms of tactics, the Russians have made a raft of changes, many of which I've talked about before, where disposable troops would go in first, draw fire, and the more elite units would follow up. They developed Wagner's infiltration assaults basically from scratch, and they changed the way they used their tanks, with Rusi observing that there was a change in the use of armor from thrust by platoon-sized groups of tanks to using tanks for indirect fire. Those of you who watched my video on helicopters will also remember the change of tactics there, from deep operations behind enemy lines that were getting all the helicopters shot down, to pitch-up attacks using unguided rockets from behind the Russian defensive positions. It may have reduced the impact on Ukrainian positions, but it also lowered helicopter losses. The list could go on, but the basic point is there. The Russian army is capable of learning, perhaps not all at once, perhaps not quickly, but it does adapt its tactics. Now, these lessons are inconsistently applied, and Unit of Mobix Does Dumb Shit could be a recurring Russian series with a new episode at least every week, but the point is the army learns. And if we're talking honestly about the strengths of the Russian military, it's not enough to talk about how they fight. You also have to talk about their ability to stay in the fight, to take a punch and keep going. And here the Russian military clearly has an advantage over many other forces around the world, because the kind of losses Russia suffered in 2022 would have irreparably wrecked many armed forces. Russia, meanwhile, shows signs of being able to regenerate and reconstitute. On one hand, this is because the Russian army seems to have quite a high casualty tolerance. Now, that might sound like I'm saying Vladimir Putin is a Marvel villain declaring that he has blood to spare, but it's a very real phenomenon. Given Ukraine's manpower losses, I'd argue it's also a strength that's applicable to them as well. Because what I'm talking about here is the capacity of a system to carry on, to not break down, to fight on, despite suffering significant equipment and personnel losses, and it operates at two distinct levels. 
At a tactical and operational level, it's made up of the ability of a country to reconstitute units with new manpower and equipment, to combine them and reorganize them in order to prevent collapse. Russia has proven capable of doing this. Not in every case. In some cases, massively depleted uh, units have been caught out of position, and that's part of what happened at Kharkiv. But in others, they've been able to fill the ranks with mobilized personnel or by combining units and brought up new equipment from reserve in order to keep units in the fight. And then at a national slash strategic level, there's the willingness of a society to absorb losses. Most external estimates suggest that Russia has suffered well over 100,000 casualties. It's an interesting contrast to the experience of the much larger, much stronger Soviet army in Afghanistan, where 15,000 KIA over 10 years was enough to convince the government to bring the troops home. And yet, there's minimal signs of disruption within Russian society outside of manpower flight, that is, people trying to leave the country to avoid mobilization. If the United States had suffered 100 plus thousand casualties in one year in Afghanistan, I imagine that probably would have given the public or the government pause. But in Russia so far, the government is holding its nerve. And that's significant when, in demographic terms, Russia does have a very large recruitable manpower pool. People often talk about Russia's demographic challenges, its ageing population, its low birth rates. All of those are medium to long-term economic challenges. But there are still millions of men out there who have done their conscript service who could potentially be put into uniform. Will it worsen Russia's long-term prospects? Yes. Will it have economic ramifications? Also, yes. But the troops are there if they're needed, and there are other alternative manpower sources as well. Prigozhin has basically cleaned out large parts of the Russian prison system by recruiting tens of thousands of prisoners into Wagner Group. Although the latest rumours suggest that the new rounds of recruitment that they're trying to launch in those same prisons aren't going particularly well, as word has gotten out that lifespan of prisoner recruits is not particularly long in Wagner once they make it to Bakhmut. So of all the challenges the Russian army faces, the number of bodies that are available to be recruited is not one of them. There might be a lack of political will to keep mobilising people and endure hundreds of thousands of casualties, and there might be a real challenge equipping and training them to an acceptable standard. And that's really important because the difference on the modern battlefield between a well-trained battle group with tanks and artillery and an untrained mob with pointy sticks is a very, very wide difference. Training and equipment matters. But the point is, if there are no political limitations and a problem can be solved with more bodies, Russia probably has the bodies to spare. Although I'd like to remind everyone that in statistical terms, Ukraine is nowhere near tapping out its manpower pool either. And so we turn to the question of equipment and the ability of Russia to equip new units and make up for the losses it has suffered. And here, the critical point to talk about first is the Russian army's equipment storages. Because the Soviet Union really, really liked tanks and armoured vehicles and also never threw anything away. They were a bit of a hoarder, so they just lined them up in these massive fields in Siberia. Russia then inherited them, and presumably because they felt loyal to Pop's legacy, didn't have the heart to throw them all away. Now, on paper, the number of vehicles in these storages, many exposed to the elements, are spectacular. More than 10,000 tanks, 4,200 self-propelled guns, 1,200 artillery pieces, 8,500 IFEs. The numbers are truly spectacular. But we've also talked in the past about why those numbers are very unlikely to translate one for one into operational vehicles. For example, while it is an imprecise exercise, one YouTuber, Kovat Kabal, bought satellite imagery of the major Russian tank depots and physically counted the vehicles, assuming that all of the storage sheds were full and then physically counting the ones that were visible in open fields. This is a tedious but ultimately very doable exercise. His estimate was that there probably weren't 10,000 tanks, but rather 6,000, and based on the visual condition of the vehicles, like some of them were clearly broken down husks, maybe half could be returned into service. That's a hard estimate to make. While you can probably make a conclusion if a tank is missing its turret and visibly rusted, you can't make any conclusions about the quality of the wiring or the presence of internal components as long as the external shell looks intact. So the real figures are probably much lower than the paper figures suggest, but that's still a very large pool of available armour. And there's a good amount of evidence that the Russians are indeed pulling stuff out of storage. When you compare before and after images of these tank depots, you see that by October, something like 600 to 700 tanks have been removed from these depots. 
I've got images there of an artillery storage depot, one image from the 26th of the 8th, 2021, and one from 24 August, 2022. And as you can see in the second image, about half of those guns, which I believe are two S7 peons, have been pulled out of storage and disappeared. And 600 to 700 tanks in a little over half a year is nothing to sneeze at. That's more than the entire strength of most armies. That's more than the annual stretch production capacity of the US Abrams production line. It's a lot of armored vehicles. Now, someone could rightly point out that evidence that vehicles are being pulled out of storage isn't evidence that they're going into service. They might still be broken down and just be moving elsewhere. But we have evidence of them making it to the front too. For one thing, we've got visual evidence of old systems that weren't in active service reaching the front lines. Russian military modernization had faced problems in the lead up to the invasion, but they weren't reliant on T-62 tanks from the mid-Cold War or World War II artillery pieces. So the appearance of these older towed guns and these T-62 tanks is pretty clear confirmation that at least some stuff is coming out of storage and going into battle. And there, it's also appearing in the confirmed loss data. So if the Russian army didn't start the war with T-62 tanks, some T-62s disappear from storage areas, the Russian army gains T-62s, and those are then lost in Ukraine, that's a pretty strong base of evidence that not all of these vehicles are moribund. Some of them can be restored and put into service. Now, most of those vehicles will require some repair or modernization before they go into battle, and that's where Russia's industrial capability comes into play. Russia is not the Soviet Union, but it still does have a significant military industry with some productive capacity that can mass produce certain products. We talked before about the Estonian intelligence estimate that estimates Russian ammunition production for artillery systems anywhere from 1.7 to 3.4 million rounds per year of all calibers. I've given you an estimate that tracked IFE production for the BMP-3 peaked at about 250 per year. And while the Russian defense industry has suffered from a myriad of issues, outdated machine tooling, inferior access to international components, issues with skilled workforce retention, high levels of indebtedness, low levels of productivity, it's still capable of performing miracles, and there has been some effort to mobilize the base, extending shifts, publicly dressing down officials that don't meet targets, things like that. And while industry is likely to be impacted by sanctions, I think it's important to keep them in perspective. It's been talked about before, for example, that Russia is dependent on imported high-tech components for the West for some of its more advanced systems. But just because those can't be sourced or sourced in sufficient quantities doesn't mean that Russia can't continue building tanks, for example. Some sharp-eyed Twitter users looking at footage the Russian government is putting out, so footage the Russian government is choosing to show us, have said it suggests that modern Russian tank models that should have advanced thermal cameras and sights are being finished and put into service with older, inferior components. They still have thermals and sites, they're just older, inferior ones that can still be produced within Russia. So while the quality of the vehicle might go down, the vehicles still continue to flow. It also doesn't stop the Russians adding Contact 1 ERA to every available surface on every armoured vehicle and calling it an upgrade package. But that's beside the point. The point is that while Russia might have very significant industrial limitations on its ability to manufacture brand new T90Ms or BMP3s, there is a larger part of the industrial base that can produce many hundreds of modernizations and repairs of older vehicles. And given that Russia has lost a visually confirmed 1,650 tanks in Ukraine as at time of recording, every 100 or 200 extra that can be brought back from storage and modernized is going to help. There's an article on the right there that I think illustrates this point fairly well. It reported that the Russian government had contracted the 103rd Armour Repair Plant, which is a plant in the far east of Russia, to modernise 800 T-62 tanks over three years. A lot of commentators pointed to this, had a laugh, and used it to illustrate Russian weakness. After all, if they were sending these ancient tanks from the 1960s, admittedly with some upgrades into battle now, they must be running out of good equipment. And there's some truth to that. If I was a tanker and I had a choice between Leo 2A6 and T-62M, it's not exactly a hard pick. But there's another way to think about this story. As far as I know, the 103rd was not actually building any tanks from scratch. So it's underutilized industrial capacity that is now producing more than 200 tanks per year. They're not very good tanks, 
but it's 200 additional tanks nonetheless. And that means if Ukraine and the West really want to run Russia out of armoured vehicles and win an attritional victory, the only options are to accelerate loss rates even further, tighten export controls so Russian production becomes even harder, or to widen the technological divide between the Ukrainian forces and their Russian opponent. Otherwise, the scale of Russian material reserves mean this war likely has a long time to go yet. So to close it all out, let's bring together these factors and what they mean for Ukraine. The first thing to say is this is not a video about Ukraine being doomed. That isn't what should be taken out of the arguments contained herein. I've talked about corruption in the Russian army and discord in the political system. I've talked about issues with the Russian training pipeline, disproportionate rates of losses, Ukrainian captured equipment from the Russians. I've talked about the will and the mobilization potential of the Ukrainian people, coupled with the economic and military capacity of the West. All those points remain valid. And I still believe that the force available to the Russians is entirely inadequate to accomplish their strategic goals. This is not a force that can seize back Kherson, that can take Kyiv, that can impose their will on the Ukrainian people and then suppress an insurgency. And if Ukraine is provided with everything the West can provide it with, I still think the long-term advantage rests squarely with them. I made this video because it's important to be realistic. And in so doing, remember some very basic points. And that is that the Russian army isn't a broken force. Russia has an extensive pool of manpower it can mobilise that's likely to be politically exhausted long before it's physically exhausted. They have enough reserve materiel, tanks, artillery pieces, ammunition and production capacity to carry on the fight for some time. And thanks to its advantages in areas like numbers, artillery, long-range strike potential, Russia retains offensive potential. It will win battles. It will take territory even in a scenario where the long-term trajectory of the war doesn't favour it. The Ukrainian military did a phenomenal job in 2022. It held back the initial Russian invasion, inflicted very heavy casualties, and then proceeded to reclaim vast tracts of territory. It mobilised its population, absorbed technology that was being supplied from the West, and proved that it could go on the offensive and seize the initiative. And the combination of Ukrainian skill, Ukrainian will to resist, Russian weaknesses and Western support now puts the Russian military in a very difficult position in Ukraine going forward. A war of attrition to wear the Russian army down over time is now clearly possible. But given the equipment and manpower reserves we've discussed, that could potentially take years. And if governments and the public in the West don't recognise the remaining Russian advantages, that sort of fight becomes much more likely. The Ukrainian army pushing the Russians out of Ukrainian territory probably requires dealing with most of those advantages. And that's going to require a lot of additional support from the West. Overcoming Russia's advantage of numbers in tanks, artillery pieces, shells and supporting equipment is going to require supplying Ukraine not just better equipment but also more of it. Overcoming Russia's advantage in the air is going to require a complete step change in support for Ukrainian air defence and air-to-air -air capabilities. And perhaps most importantly, Ukraine would benefit from long-range strike capabilities, something that pushed Russian logistics back further than was practical, that put Russian concentrations in the crosshairs. One of the mistakes Russia made in planning its February invasion was in massively underestimating the will and capacity of the Ukrainian armed forces to fight. It would be folly of the highest order to return the favour. All right, channel update to close out. I thought a lot about doing this topic, but I felt ultimately it was important to do. The thing that ultimately pushed me over the edge where I decided to do it, to make a video highlighting Russia's strengths as opposed to explaining underperformance, was the vote in the topic poll that happened recently where this was very clearly topic number one on everyone's agenda. A big thank you to all those who contributed to this work. A big thank you to Rusi for producing their reports. Thank you to those of you in Ukraine who engaged with me in preparation for this. And of course, credit to Covert Cabal for sitting there and physically counting Russian tanks at tanks reserve depots for I don't know how many hours. I should have some channel updates next week about a planned incremental upgrade in my sound package and also an update on charitable causes because I like to give one of those at least once per month. Thank you again very much for listening. And with any luck, I will see you all again next week.